Put your hands together for Avinash Satvalekar, President of Franklin Templeton Asset Management India. Last time when we met, last year this time, he'd completed just about 100 days in India. He'd spent much of it on the road meeting all of you. And from what Sharma ji just said, uh, he's actually spent uh, a lot of the last 15 months on the road. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to him about all of the Parivartan that he's been able to bring at Franklin Templeton, India, 15 months into the job. So welcome. Thank you. Good to be back. I tell you, I'm feeling uh, overshadowed by Sharma ji, but now I'm in familiar territory. And, you know, when I said last year, this time, 100 days into the job, it had been a breathless 100 days, 15 months into this job, what is the kind of parivartan that, you know, you've been able to kick off? So firstly, I don't think any Paripartan is kicked off by one individual. It's a team effort. Um, I think just the fact that we've been able to change the narrative to a certain extent, uh, that is a huge change, right? For us, um, it has been a bit of a journey. It has been a tough journey, and we're now that's all in the rear view mirror. Um, so, I know you talked about, I mean, it all started with obviously um, getting out there and engaging, right? For me, engaging with our partners was, I think, the number one um, change that I wanted. Yeah. And I didn't know it was a change, actually, and I don't think it was necessarily that dramatic a change. I just thought it was important for me to get in front of our partners, hear firsthand from our partners what they thought were issues what they thought were problems, how did they think we should address them. And um, the good thing is that we've got excellent partners. Right? All of you um, have been incredibly honest, right? So you've been incredibly honest with the good things that Franklin Templeton has done, um, but you've been especially honest with our areas of improvement. Um, and that has been helpful for us. So that parivartan, a lot of that change that we're instituting now is a consequence of a lot of the feedback we've received, what I've received also firsthand from talking to our partners. Okay. You've had time to listen to them. You've had time to take stock. You've also worked in, you know, many global locations of Franklin Templeton. Uh, I want to now start talking about what happens next. And so in terms of uh, global products, in terms of, you know, the best investment practices, what's brewing? Um, what could be headed this way? What is a good fit for India, which is not here yet? So I think there's a lot of parivartan that is happening in our industry itself, right? Um, one of the things, if you look back five years, the level of global investing that occurred in India was marginal. That has accelerated in the last few years at a dramatic pace. And I don't see that necessarily slowing down. Now what has changed for the mutual fund industry is that we have had certain restrictions. Mm. And those restrictions at some point will get lifted or we'll find alternative ways. But I think the percentage of global in any portfolio is going to increase. And it has to increase. Whether it is from uh, a perspective of balancing out and diversifying your asset pool, whether it is setting up for a longer term transition, there are multiple reasons why I think every portfolio should have a global aspect to it. And it has nothing to do with how bullish I am or not on India. On India, right. Because the number one reason you always get is, um, well, if I'm getting 15% in India, why do I want to go anywhere else? Yeah. Right? My view is that that 15% always has ups and downs. And like with any market, it is going to have ups and downs. And having a diversified portfolio helps 
cushion that and so we need that. So I think global is going to be a big thing. What we bring in um, as a firm is an expertise that is exceptional on the international front. And with our acquisition of Leg Mason in 2020, the options of global products that we can bring in have just gone up exponentially. So I think there is a lot of opportunity. Now, as far as um, global practices, um, I don't think anybody in here is going to be surprised by this, but I'm going to ask you a question. God, better not make it a tough one. Okay. Uh, it, it won't be a tough one. It's actually quite an easy one. So when you talk about business practices, right? Mm -hmm. um, in mutual funds, you've heard of the concept of SIP. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now let me ask you first, what does that stand for? Systematic Investment Plan. Brilliant. Well done. Ten on ten. This has actually not been uh, rehearsed. Huh? So <laughs> for any of you that are thinking this is rehearsed, actually Mansi is doing an incredible job right now answering this. Who brought SIPs to India? I mean, I I'm making an educated guess here. Franklin Templeton. Exactly. So the reason I highlight that is there are a lot of, I mean, not in this audience, this audience is experienced. None of them are going to be surprised by that. But I was recently at a, at a talk, and um, the discussion was about the concept of dollar cost averaging and how that was an important concept. Now, when it was brought to India, or when India started doing it, it was called rupee cost averaging. Hmm. And um, it was still a very dry concept. Right? I mean, you go to a retail investor, and say, you know, you want to do rupee cost averaging. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Now, it's not a difficult concept. But then the, the speaker said, you know, one of the fund houses brought this concept of SIP. And just like that, overnight, everybody understood the concept of a regular systematic investment plan. Now, it wasn't some fund house, right? It so was. I think people have forgotten. So in terms of new initiatives, new practices, I think those are things that Franklin has always done well. And I have to admit, I didn't know. You know, you did catch me unawares on that one, that Franklin Templeton actually introduced yeah. SIPs. Yeah. And it's so embedded now. Absolutely. Uh, as far as uh, mutual fund investors go. I've got a lot of ground to cover with Avi, so you'll find me crisscrossing here a little bit. Um, many new players entering this space. Uh, and I want you to answer as honestly as possible. Because if you, say, if you say, if you say <laughs> that there's always opportunity, etc., I'm going to grill you. How is Absolutely. there opportunity? The bottom line is many new players entering the market. How are you seeing this, this evolution or this change? So let's talk about a few um, stats to start with, right? The penetration of mutual funds in India is less than 5%. Yeah. Right? Compare that with the US, which is 50%. Now, this is, for all intents and purposes, the most sophisticated financial market, right? That is 50%. Mm -hmm. We are at 5%, which is yeah. a fraction of it, yeah. right? If I look at it as a percentage of GDP, AUM as a percentage of GDP, the global average is 75. Hmm. We are around 20. Okay. Right? So we have a ton of room to go. Right? Let's talk about size. The Indian mutual fund industry is about $500 billion, give or take. We have 42 players. The US mutual fund industry is $26 trillion. And they have over 7,000 fund houses, right? So it's not a question of the number of players, right? To me, I mean, I know you said you're going to grill me if there's an opportunity, right? What is the biggest problem we have? The biggest problem we have in my mind is that the level of financial education, of financial literacy, is not high. Do we have high literacy rates? Yes. If you look at like, the general literacy rates, they're pretty high. But financial literacy is not as high. 
So if I look at any of the new players coming in, right, and if you talk about even the fintechs, the biggest advantage with them is that they are educating at a speed that we have not seen before. Okay. So what does that mean? We have, let's say, a 4 5% penetration. Hmm. We need to get that up to at least 20%. Let's take double it, 10%. Now, if I'm talking about $500 billion, a doubling of that size, we're talking about a trillion dollars. 42 players splitting a trillion dollars? There's plenty of opportunity. I mean, of course, a lot depends on the pace at which investors enter the market versus the players. And, but, you know, we're not going to split hairs. I get... I concede your general point here. Um, you talked about fintechs. And, you know, there are two other aspects to what's going on in India right now. So I just want to understand how you see the fintech piece particularly playing out, affecting the space that you occupy. Um, I don't think it affects the space we occupy right? Fintechs are a needed and an important part of the ecosystem. What they're doing is bringing a set of, like I said, an education at a much faster pace, consumption of that education in a much more interesting format. Right? We're learning. There's tons to learn. Right? Now, we all know, and any of us that has teenage kids knows that the attention span of any of these kids has shrunk, right? So you have to be able to grab their attention immediately. Now, what the fintechs have been amazing at doing is gamifying a lot of financial concepts, right? So I would much rather have a much wider base of investors that understands financials in order to be able to then take advantage of that. Okay. So in my mind, fintechs are an accelerant that our industry needs. And it's an accelerant across. It's not just mutual funds. It's happening in insurance. It's happening in every aspect. Sure. I think in general, I think technology, and we'll hear more about it when my colleague from the US, Jonathan, comes up and talks about it. But I think technology is affecting every aspect, every industry, every business. And, and you've sort of preempted what I wanted to ask you about technology being both a disruptor and an enabler, and how specifically you see it changing the asset management landscape in India. And this is a question I'm going to put to every guest uh, today because it's an important one and we want to hear all of the different perspectives that come in. So disruptor, enabler, you've already alluded to the enabler piece, uh, but your thoughts? I think I've always viewed technology as an enabler. Um, I'm not one of those where, you know, there's tons of reports that have come out now with AI coming on, 70% of the jobs are going to be gone. Um, and there may be some element of truth to that. But what they're not talking about is the number of new jobs that are going to be created. Right? If you look at any technology evolution over the years, right? simple thing. Right? Think of horse-drawn carriages moving to cars. Were there job destruction? Of course there was. The guy that had the horse carriage didn't have a job because he didn't know how to drive necessarily. But then you created roles for drivers. So in my mind, it's always going to be a function of creating new jobs that we don't even know exist today. Okay. So for us, since you talked about our industry, I think the usage, and I think most of you, the level of technology you're using today versus even two years ago or three years ago is guaranteedly gone up. And if it hasn't, you're feeling that pain, which means you're playing catch up right now. So in my mind, technology is a huge enabler for our business. And it is only going to be a positive driver for growth for us across the board. Okay, I want to regroup here a little bit and take a sort of broader question to Avi next. Uh, it took about 
16 years for assets under management to grow 10 times, hit 46 lakh crore, 50 lakh crore kind of mark, and this was the first phase of growth. We've talked about how awareness is potentially on the cusp of uh, increasing dramatically. But I'm putting a much broader question to you. We have four crow investors today. Uh, what kind of parivartan do you really hope to see to bring about the next phase of growth? What are the things that are going to come together to propel that next phase of growth? So, I mean, one of the first things when a lot of what we're doing right now is, as you know, we spend a lot of time on training. So the Franklin Templeton Academy is, I would say, industry leading. It has been industry leading for a long time. So the biggest focus, and I think this is a focus even um, that uh, Prime Minister Modi has highlighted, is the whole concept of financial inclusion. Okay. That is incredibly important not just for us as an industry, but for us as a nation, right? I mean, if you look at most countries, what has happened is the level of income inequality has gone so out of whack, whether it's the US, whether it's China, whether it's Europe. We have to be able to pull in more people into that broader net. So that financial inclusion the approach to doing that is increasing awareness. The way you increase awareness, you increase education, you increase training. That has to happen. Because and other just than that... increase just general comfort, you absolutely. know. I mean, two years ago, my driver would be diffident about a money transfer phone to phone. Yeah. Today, he's like, Paytm kar do, or yeah. whatever, you know. So, sorry I interrupted it, No, no, it's answer. actually, that's a perfect analogy. Because if you think about, like... I mean, COVID was horrible. But one of the best things that happened because of COVID is the level of adoption of technology, the level of education, right? So now if I know I can electronically transfer money back and forth, I start thinking about what I can do with that money that is sitting electronically. Yeah. Right? So I think that level of education, taking that next step, right? So there is obviously a very good understanding now that everybody has a bank account. Hmm. The next step is making sure that what is in that bank account is actually working for you and working hard for you, right? And that's where we need to see the change. The other element I would say is that um, we need to see the number of women investors increase dramatically. I just had a chat earlier today uh, with one of our uh, guests who's going to be coming in on the stage uh, later on. And um, I said, how do you manage your money? Well, actually, my husband takes care of that. I said, why? Why does your husband take care of it? Well, because he does that for a living. He's a wealth manager and stuff like that. So I said, does that mean you don't need to know how you manage? You earn. You make a good living. You should take responsibility of how you manage that money. Right? I'm not saying you take it away from your husband right now. Last thing you want to do is create yeah, issues today. Right? But should you have an intelligent conversation? Should you be able to have an intelligent conversation? That is critical. And the other reason for that is, and this is something that we are working with on, on the, uh, in the rural markets or in the B30 markets, is to say that when you look at women investors, right, when you educate, I mean, that's the whole premise of microfinance, right? When you bring in and you provide a loan to a woman in a village, the entire village benefits. Yeah. So if I can educate, or as an industry, we can educate more women to be better investors or become investors, it's not just benefiting them and their immediate family. The it benefits the entire community. So I think if you ask me what longer term parivartan we need, that is one of those that we definitely need. You know, uh, when we're talking about co increasing comfort, increasing awareness, uh, just getting comfortable with the ideas of mutual funds, uh, one piece is 
that people seem to understand, or at least retail investors, understand equity easier than fixed income. And you know, you can correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but they seem to have their head around equity more easier, so you see more retail traction as far as equity is concerned. So what will it take to bring more retail investors into fixed income? So I think fixed income, quite honestly, is um, it's that stable income stream that you need. Now, the average retail investor looks at banks as having provided that, and banks have done a very good job of providing that. In my mind, what it misses out on is the opportunity to take advantage of changes in rates of return. So, where are we right now, for example? Interest rates have gone up quite a bit. Are they going to stay up there for a certain period of time? And I'm sure we'll hear from both Sonal and Rahul when they come up and talk about where they see the interest rates moving. But if I'm looking at two, three years down the road, rates should be lower. Now, when rates go down, you actually have capital gains in fixed income, which as a fixed deposit or a savings deposit, you don't get that benefit. In a debt fund, you do get that benefit. So there is, I think, a, there needs to be a change in the way we approach fixed income, the way we talk about fixed income. Because there is a bit of a, so when you look at assured return assets, bank deposits, yeah, real estate. Mm. Now, real estate, in my mind, if you look at, that's not really assured returns. It's just people like to have that. And I'm guilty of that. Everybody, you're not, you're actually in the majority, so they don't feel too uh, bad about it. But I think there is, needs to be more education around that, and I think that will change. Now is a perfect time, if you ask me. Yes, there has been issue around the debt indexation and the tax changes and stuff. Does that make it tougher? Yes, it does. But from a rate perspective, yeah. In my mind, it actually couldn't be a better time. Fertile ground for that, and I'm sure we're going to see evidence of that push from Franklin Templeton. So, new focus areas over the next 12 months. What are you, one, two, three, really prioritizing out there? Anything new that your partners would like to hear about first, which is in the pipeline? Um, so, at the risk of sounding, uh, I think, boring, I think last year when we talked about this, um, I've shared our entire st strategic plan is based on three main pillars. Re-engagement, investment, and products, right? And what I said then was that this is the same theme you're gonna hear for the next three years minimum because we're gonna have to keep building on this. So. What did we do last year? Right? We did a tremendous amount of re-engagement. And that was not just a one-year thing. That is the way we are now interacting and changing. So I hadn't realized that I had traveled 30,000 kilometers, but I'm sure that Somebody's somebody is keeping, tabs. keeping, I'm sure the yeah. travel department is keeping tabs of that, right? Yeah. I don't see that changing, and that should not change. In fact, my expectation would be everyone in our team would be doing that level. Because the only way you can actually reach out, explain an idea, is do it face to face. I do think that that is important. Having said that, now, what did we do? We've brought on a number of partners in the last 15 months, 18 months, that did not partner with us previously. So if I'm looking at national level distributors, we had two. We now have 15. Okay. Sorry, I, correction as of last month, 16. So I feel like that engine has started to move. So what do we need to do next? I'm sure a lot of you have seen the announcement that came out in August when we brought in our new fixed income CIO, Rahul Goswami, and you'll hear from him later on. Uh, today and tomorrow as well. So fixed income couldn't, I mean, this couldn't have come at a better time. I just finished telling you why I felt real, re, retail investors should be looking at fixed income. 
we've got a new team in place. I think we will start seeing that big traction. Gain traction, both on the retail front as well as on our institutional front. So I think it is more, it's not so much something new. It is more about executing constantly on the plan that we have. Okay. As far as products go, it, there are certain products. I mean, you saw us fill in a gap, and we will fill in gaps where we need to. What we will bring in terms of new products is where we have gaps, like I said, or we will reposition existing products. So one of the products that we repositioned last year was the India Opportunities Fund, and it has done exceedingly well. So rather than constantly bringing out NFOs, and I know a lot of my partners ask me this when I travel, is when is the next new fund coming? Rather than constantly bringing out new funds, I would rather bring out or change something that serves a differentiated purpose in your portfolios. I'm going to do a quick rapid fire round with you because there are a couple of things I have to do and I've got that clock staring at me, okay? And I do want to know whether... Uh, you know, you have some fresh thoughts about some of these uh, questions. Sure. Uh, the 401k, that was the inflection point as far as growth of mutual funds in the US was concerned. We've talked about what will trigger the next phase of growth in uh, India. So are we already sort of at that inflection point? We're getting close. Yeah. Um, 401k, I mean, for those of you that don't know, is the pension plan system in the US where... Um, Every month, just out of your paycheck, a certain portion goes, and you can allocate it to certain mutual funds. That really drove the mutual fund growth in the U.S. Are we there in, U in India? No, we're not there. Do we need to have something similar? Yes. Is so we've made baby steps, right? If you look at EPFO, if you look at NPS, there is now an allocation hmm. going towards equities. Um, we need to accelerate that. We need to be able to make that as a choice that an individual investor can make as opposed to it being made for you. But it all ties back then to the education part of it in getting that financial literacy up. So in my mind, are we close to that inflection point? Yes, we are. Not We're getting yet. close to it. But are we there yet? No. But we are very close to it. The other thing that one notices is the growing interest in passive investing. And, you know, it's happened between 2019, 2023. Yeah. And they're now at, what, 16% or so um, of assets under management. You know, to an outsider, it seems like a challenge to active management. Yeah. What's your view? So, I mean, most of you know that I was a fund manager before. So, I'm biased uh, when I say that active management does add value. But I don't think this is a zero-sum game. Meaning, I do not think that the success of passive has to come at the expense of an active manager. They both will coexist. They both solve different needs at different times for investors. So in my mind, I don't see passives as, oh, if passives come in, then all of a sudden actives are going to lose or that we are going to have a challenge. We have passives ourselves. Are we likely to launch more passives? There is definitely something that we're looking at in the passive space. But it is a joint. It is not going to be one or the other that wins. So they'll grow in tandem. That's the point that you're Absolutely. making. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is investors in India, they typically tend to invest for less than three years. And if you really want to absorb the benefits, you have to do long-term investing. So you may end up answering me, Avi, by looking at by making some of the points that you've already alluded to, and it comes down to a basic awareness. Um, but what can you do to make people understand you've got to stay invested at least five years? No, so I think that's a challenge for everybody, every market, right? It's not just happening here. Even if I take the U.S., for example, it wasn't too long ago where U.S. holding periods were measured in years, now, they are measured in months, right? So it's not, I mean, if you think about it, um, just as human beings, our attention span has shrunk. 
Tell me about it. Right? With each generation. So you should not be surprised that everything is shrinking as a consequence of that. If I don't have the attention span to sit through a two-hour education and I want it bite-sized in 15 minutes or God forbid a minute and a half on TikTok stretched out, right? You can't expect that same individual to all of a sudden get wise and say that, oh, I'm going to invest for five years or ten years now. Also, I feel that there, I mean, it does boil down to a certain amount of education. It does boil down to how you show wealth is created. And this Hammer is... that point home. Yeah, I mean, it is actually, I mean, all of you as partners and distribution, you have tremendous examples in your own portfolios of clients that have stayed invested for five or ten years. And you can see the growth in their portfolio versus somebody that churns constantly. And so long as you can show those live examples, that is what is going to drive. That is the only way people understand is if they see true evidence and there's somebody that can show that has experienced that themselves. So it just takes time, okay. unfortunately. We're out of time, but I'm going to take the liberty of one final question. Any message for your partners here? Let me roll in something else to that. You're an avid reader. Is there a book recommendation that you'd like to share and why? Sure. Um, so as far as book goes, um, the one that I'm reading right now is a title. It's a kind of longish title. It's, uh, and let's hope I remember it correctly. It's, this is how they tell me the world ends. Right? It's a bit of a mouthful, but it is about cybersecurity. And since we've talked and spent a lot of time on technology and the advent of technology and the usage of technology, um, I found this book fascinating, uh, downright scary. At, I mean, I, I'm, it's about a 700 page book, and I'm about 150 pages into it, and I'm a bit petrified. But it's fascinating to look at it. So that's a book. Uh, as far as final. Uh, kind of thoughts. Firstly, thank you very much for making the time. I know it's um, a lot of you have traveled a long distance. We appreciate it. Um, I hope you will get over the next day and a half something that I strongly believe Franklin Templeton has done very well and that is provide thought leadership on topics that range from finance to name it. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and once again, thank you very much for coming and I look forward to engaging with you in the future. Avi, thank you. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.